continuing uh, in our study of, of Lamentations. Last week we finished looking at, at chapter 2. I then read chapter 3. You see how this is working. Finished chapter 2. I read chapter 3. I was talking about chapter 3, just briefly commenting on chapter 3. And we're now in the middle of that. So the game plan is, is I'm going to finish my remarks on chapter 3. I'll then read chapter 4. Go to chapter 4 and start going down through it. As I said, it's out of sync here. I wish that we could start with reading the chapter and then commenting, but uh, I'd have to just sit here and wait like 20 minutes to do that. So we're just going to carry on the way we've been doing it and hope that you can remember uh, what's been read. All right, now, so it, when we ended last week, if I recall correctly, I just finished commenting on, on uh, verses 34 to 36, which in my understanding that these are examples of Judah's social sins, sins that contributed to the necessity of God's judgment. And this was, a, this was a big aspect of the judgment. You can see it from the other texts that I read, that you had people in Judah who were exploiting the poor. They were using their position and their power and their privilege to get what they wanted. They were denying justice to people. So that's how I read those verses, 34 to 36. Not everybody sees them that way, but that's what I think is going on. So now we pick back up with uh, verses 37 to 39. Repeats that that the Babylonian conquest, that this was decreed by God as punishment for their sin. You see, who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it. You see, that's that's what's going on here. And since they were being punished for their sins, they have no ground for complaint. They're simply reaping their just deserts. You see, when God judges and punishes for your sin, you're in no position to complain about it. I mean, any more than when the law comes and grabs you and you're caught breaking in somewhere. You say, what are you doing? Well, you say, well, you're getting justice for what you're doing. And he says that's especially true of those who are doubly true for those he's allowed to remain alive. Right? He says here, he says, why should a living man complain? (laughs) A man about the punishment of his sin. Now, interesting, when he says here that it's not from the, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? He's speaking from the perspective of, of the Israelites. Blessing and curse, you see. Good and bad. Punishment, blessing and punishment come. God is not the author of evil, you see. But from the perspective of the recipient, it's bad, right? I mean, that's what the whole thing's about. He's sitting there going, this is terrible. Okay, so then the 37 to 39. Then in 40 to 42... They're an appeal for the people to examine their ways and to repent. This is, this is a call to understand how you have been, how you've been living, how you've been rebelling, and to repent. You see, this is, this is what God ultimately desires from people, that they are to repent. He tells them to lift their hearts and hands to God in prayer, confessing their blatant rebellion and acknowledging that their punishment was for their sin. You see, he says, which he hasn't forgiven us. He wanted to forgive them. He begged them to come and repent over and over and over and over. And they just get no, 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 drop dead. So he wants them to repent. But they didn't. And then he judged Judah and particularly judged Jerusalem. Verses 43 to 45, he declares that God pursued them in his righteous anger Killing them without pity. You see, this is the execution of judgment. And the idea we have that God, God, he will, he will never execute judgment. He's just, he, he can't bring himself to execute. Oh, he can. He can. And he will. And he has. And when it says here, killing them without pity. When he executes judgment, he executes it. And so this is what, 43 to 45, he turned a deaf ear to their prayers, and through their defeat he made them like scum and garbage in the estimation of the nations. That's how, pe- that's how people looked at this, this nation that had been there. So proud, so prosperous and all that, and they're looking at him just saying, you're just scum. You're absolutely worthless. You're nothing. 46 to 48 refers to the rejoicing, the mocking, and the ridicule that they're receiving from all their enemies. This comes up over and over again. I've talked about this, where you have this this mocking where people who are just rejoicing in your suffering, rejoicing in what's happened to you, it adds to the pain. And here are these people, (laughs) you see, you worthless 
I can't stand you, and I'm so happy that you're suffering. You deserve to suffer. You needed to suffer. So this is what you see. This Verse 47 is a general statement of the disaster they experienced as panic, pitfall, devastation, and destruction. These are just pictures of difficulty, suffering uh, that he puts in there. He recounts in verse 48 how much he's cried because of Jerusalem's fall. My eyes flow with rivers of tears because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. So here again we see this idea just crying. Why? Because it is a nightmare. You see? It's not just words on a page. It is existence. It is life. It is a nightmare. And people who've gone through, say, war, uh, you know, the situations you can read about in World War II, uh, you know, the, this is just what's pouring out of this poet. Is he, he says, this is just absolutely horrible. Verses 49 to 51, he says, he will continue crying until the Lord takes note of their suffering, meaning until he acts to alleviate it. You see, just look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to stand here and cry until you do something. It's that painful. It's that gut-wrenching. In verse 52, he says his eyes cause him grief because by them he's witnessed the terrible things that happened in the city. These are the instruments that brought this stuff into his mind. The horrible images. The suffering. The pain. The things that he said, I, I, I wish I hadn't seen them. They're that bad. And God said, what do you think I was telling you? Why do you think I was warning you and telling you, be faithful to me, don't rebel against me? And here it is. And it's so bad, this person sits here and he says, look, his eyes have caused him grief. Now, 52 to 66, I have to warn you, I take, an, I take a different view. So when I tell you that, see, that's a caution to you to be doubly careful with what I'm telling you. Okay? Because I've thought about it, read many things about it, don't like what is the standard view of what's going on in 52 to 66. Okay, the typical, the common view of 52 to 66 is that it really is something dealing with the Babylonians. That the Babylonians, it is a cry for God to judge the Babylonians for their mistreatment or overzealousness in executing God's judgment. Okay, that's the, that's the normal view. Now, I don't think that's right. I have trouble fitting that in with a couple of things that he says in here. Now, in my view, I look at it and I say, having just spoken of the tremendous pain and grief that God's judgment on Jerusalem produced, what I think the poet's doing is that in 52 to 66, he's balancing that with a personal example of the kind of evil that brought God's wrath. In other words, I think the poet now speaks personally. Remember, he was speaking as the representative sufferer. Now I think the poet is going to give himself as an example of the kind of evil in Judah that brought God's wrath. In other words, I think he's now relating his personal mistreatment in Judah as an illustration of the nation's rebellion to reinforce the justice of God's judgment. He goes here and he mentions, he talks about the social sins of Judah. That, that helped bring about it. Then he goes through how painful the judgment is again and again. Now I think he's going back and giving his own suffering and how he was mistreated as an example of the sin in Judah that brought about God's judgment. That, that horrific and gut-wrenching punishment was from another side. It was the vindication of the victims of Judah's wickedness. And I think that's what he's doing. I'll go through here and I'll... I'll Comment on it and see if, see if it makes sense to you. Okay, in verses 52 to 54, we see that the poet here was, was persecuted unjustly, thrown into a pit and stoned to the point he was at the brink of death, the point of saying, I'm lost. Like the waters are covering my head, it's over, I'm through. Now, this sounds a lot like Jeremiah. Not in all the details, you see. It depends on how you take this thing about, you know, they cast stones on me. If it means stoning, which I think is probably likely, you don't have a report of Jeremiah being stoned, but you certainly in Jeremiah 38, you have him cast in the cistern, this righteous man who is trying to tell the truth what happens. He gets thrown in there. So you say, well, maybe it is Jeremiah, and there are just aspects of his mistreatment that aren't recorded in Scripture. That's possible. Or maybe it's simply another righteous person who was treated in a way similar to Jeremiah. 
But I think the point is, is that he's saying that, listen, look how the evil in Judah manifested itself with regard to me. Just as an illustration of the heart and wickedness that was present in Judah. Here he is thrown into a pit, stoned to the point he's at the brink of death. The point of saying I'm lost, you see, and then he says I've been hunted like a bird by those who were my enemies without cause. You see, that's one of the things that makes me think, I just have a hard time getting that he would be saying without cause because there's plenty of cause for the Babylonians to come in and kill them because it was their sin and their rebellion and all that. I think he's saying, no, this is what happened to me by the Judeans in whose presence I was trying to tell them something and how did they treat me? Shut up. Just like Jeremiah, if it's not Jeremiah. Throw him in here, shut him up. Take care of him. Leave him to die. And that's an indication you see something wrong with the heart. He says in 55 to 7, he says that he called out to God in the most dire situation and that God responded telling him not to fear. It sounds like this has already happened. You see, so it seems to me he has been, this is his punishment. He was mistreated by evil people in Judah. He's almost to the point of death, having been cast in this pit, having been stoned to the point he was going to die, saying, I'm lost. He cries out to God. God, in fact, rescued him from the pit. He rescued him and tells him not to fear, delivered him from the deadly peril in which the evil men had placed him. So God had already, already responded. And then he says in 58 through 60, they recount what the poet said, I think, back at the time of his deliverance. Back when, when he was cast there, when he was in such dire straits, he was almost dead. He cries out to the Lord. The Lord says, okay, I hear you. The Lord delivered him from that peril. And then he recounts what he said at that time. And he praised God for having taken up his cause, for redeeming his life. And he then calls on Yahweh to administer justice. See, to take account of the wicked people. It's like when Habakkuk cries out and he says, how can you allow the evil of Judah to go on? How can you do it? You're a just God, a righteous God, a holy God, and you see how these people are living. And I see that in the mistreatment of this poet. As he cries out to God and he says, listen, you know, look, I want you to take note of what they've done. Take note of how, they're, how they have treated me. You see, act in judgment. Act in judgment knowing how I have been victimized by evil people. In other words, judge my cause. Judge, is, judge Judah for its wickedness. I think that's what's, what's going on here. He says that in 61 and 63, they continue in my judgment the poet's words from the time of his deliverance. And he says that God knew how they had acted toward him and thus how deserving they were of judgment. Here he is, an honest man, a righteous man, seeking to bring truth to them, to help them. And how do they treat him? We're going to kill him. Innocent blood. We're going to kill him. Cries out to God. God delivers him. He says, look at how they are. Look how they treat me. And he cries out for that. And God then, see, the way I take this, 64 to 66, I take this now as his statement that in the judgment of Jerusalem that they're still experiencing. Okay, you've had the exile and all that, but the whole thing has been he's sitting here in rubble and talking about the nightmare of the experience. And I think he's saying that in that, you are repaying the people who have acted so wickedly. Okay, so now what does that require? The reason I have brackets here, you see, this is an imp these verbs are imperfect in Hebrew. And typically, the imperfect is translated with a future. Okay, that's why you look at the translations and you'll see that it'll say, you will repay them. That's why people say, okay, if he were talking about the Babylonians, I would understand that. That would make perfect sense. But see, you can translate the imperfect as a present progressive. And if the context justifies it, that's how you would. The reason it's not translated that way is that people don't share my understanding of what's unfolding. If I'm right in the context, then the way you would take that would be as a present progressive. Just so you know, I'm not making that up. Let me read to you a quick quote from Mark Furtado in his grammar, Beginning Biblical Hebrew. He says, the present progressive imperfect is used for expressing an ongoing situation in the present. Best translated in English with the present progressive tense, the examples he provides are he is seeking, he is writing, he is ruling. Whenever anybody's giving you brackets in a translation, 
you got to ask why. <laughs> you see, when I'm doing this anyway. Because that means I'm giving you something that, that is out of the ordinary. And I'm trying to explain to you why I'm doing it. It is grammatically justifiable if the context dictates it. And the way I understand it, the context does dictate it. So what I'm saying to you is in 34, he's saying this person who had suffered unjustly, who had been victimized by evil Judeans, though a righteous man, think Jeremiah or somebody like Jeremiah. Because they had been treated that way, he is now saying he had cried out for God to judge the people for their wickedness. And then here he's saying, you are repaying them, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. You are giving them anguish of heart. Your curse is on them. You are pursuing them in anger and destroying them from under your heavens, O Lord. He's saying that this is your execution of judgment of their wickedness, as was exemplified in their mistreatment of me. That makes more sense to me than saying that this is a complaint about Babylonian mistreatment. Okay, God is going to judge the Babylonians. You see, there's no question about that. But my thinking is, what I've just explained to you fits better. Now, you take that, I say, you take that with an abundance of caution. Because that is, a, uh, that is an exotic, unusual, out of the mainstream view. Okay? But I think it's right or I wouldn't say it to you. But you need to be aware that, uh, that that's how that is. All right, let me read chapter 4. How the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold is changed. The holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. The precious sons of Zion, worth their weight in fine gold, how they are regarded as earthen pots, the work of potter's hands. Even jackals offer the breast. They nurse their young, but the daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives to them. Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple embrace ash heaps. For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment, and no hands were laid on her, you see, there's a little footnote here that the meaning is, is hard to grasp. I think the better meaning is no hands were laid on her in the uh, end of verse 6. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Now their face is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as wood. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger, who wasted away, pierced by lack of the fruits of the field. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger, and he kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor any of the inhabitants of the world, that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. This was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests, who shed in the midst of her the blood of the righteous. They wandered blind through the streets. They were so defiled with blood that no one was able to touch their garments. Away! Unclean! People cried at them. Away! Away! Do not touch! So they became fugitives and wanderers. People said among the nations, they shall stay with us no longer. The Lord himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. No honor was shown to the priests, no favor to the elders. Our eyes failed, ever watching vainly for help. In our watching, we watched for a nation which could not save. They dogged our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end drew near, our days were numbered. For our end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles in the heavens. They chased us on the mountains. They lay in wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pits. Of whom we had said, under his shadow we shall live among the nations. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who dwell in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup shall pass. You shall become drunk and strip yourself bare. 
The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, will end. I'll explain that little thing. It says, is accomplished. I think better read, will end. He will keep you in exile no longer. But your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he will punish. He will uncover your sins. Okay, let's talk about uh, chapter 4. I hope that, uh, as I say, I, I, I could just comment on it, but I like to read each of the poems. Uh, just because they were created that way, and I think there's an impact that comes from doing that. At least I hope so. All right, in, cha- in chapter 4, verse 1, it refers to the destruction of the temple. You see, the gold has figuratively grown dim. It doesn't literally lose its glow, but it has grown dim. It has changed so as to lose its preciousness in conjunction with the scattering of the temple's holy stones throughout the city as the temple is destroyed. The glory of the temple is diminished. And that's what this is about, the, you know, the gold here has, has gr- grown dim. It's figuratively been changed so as to lose its preciousness in the destruction of the temple. He says in verse 2 that in the conquest of Jerusalem, the precious inhabitants of the city have been regarded as being as of little value as clay pots. See, these clay pots, they were proverbial for their cheapness. So he says these inhabitants who were precious, they were tremendously valued. They have been treated like we'd say like a cardboard box. (laughs) Just treated like of of absolute no value. Proverbial cheapness. They've been treated that way. He says in verse 3 that the situation in Jerusalem was so dire that at least some of the women became cruel toward their own young. Now this is the thing, ladies, I know this, this, you have to know that, right? What's that say about the circumstances? They became cruel toward their own young in the sense they acted selfishly toward them out of a sense of self-preservation. Now that's got to be a dire situation. That's got to be unimaginable suffering for somebody to act that way toward their child. See, in so doing, they compared unfavorably to jackals. And in, in, in refusing, see, to, to show giving toward their own children and acting out of this sense of self-preservation, they compared unfavorably to jackals. He said, the jackals offer the breast. They compared unfavorably to jackals and they were acting like ostriches, which interestingly, they were noted for the neglect of their young. You can see that in Job 39, 16. Just because of how ostriches acted, they became proverbial for those that neglected their young. And here he's saying, the situation here was that horrible. Is that mothers were acting as, he says, they nurse, but the daughter of my people has become cruel. Out of a sense of self preservation, cruel toward their own young. Verse 4, he refers to the fact that nursing infants, they were so weak from starvation, so thirsting for life sustaining milk, that they no longer cried when they were hungry. That seems to be the, the uh, meaning of this idea of the tongue sticking to the roof of the mouth is that it, there was no sound. They were mute. And so they were in such dire straits that they didn't make a sound. Can you think of anything more pitiful? They didn't even make a sound. They were starving and so hungry. Now the children old enough to speak, what do they do? Well, they're begging for food, but food is so scarce, nobody gives them anything. Little kids. Uh, you have anything? To... No. There's not enough for me to survive. It's just, it, you know, it, it's like, and what is the point? What, why does God tell us this? They just want us to sit and say, yeah, you know, kind of get into, he's telling this to us for a reason. He is saying that it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That when God judges it is no laughing matter. It is no light thing. It is no cool thing that you knock off with, you know, hey, prepare to meet thy God. Okay, yo. You know, let me straighten up my tie. I'm cool. It's not like that. You see, our society keeps saying it's like that. That it's a joke. Oh, judgment. Ha, ha, judgment. Oh, yeah, okay. No, I'm not into that hell stuff. I'm not into judgment stuff. I'm into a God who lets me be who I want to be. In other words, I'm into me being God. You see, and the message here is God is God and God will judge. And when God judges, it is your worst nightmare. 
Now, why, why would God want us to know that? He would want us to know that so we will not fall into the same situations these people did. When we sit here and say about God, I don't care, I don't care. No, we'll be. God, what do you want? You are God. You are the holy, righteous, deserving God. And we will give you our lives and live for you. That's why he's telling us this. That's why he's painting it this way. He could have had somebody just say, by the way, Jerusalem fell. He didn't do that. He has the inspired poet say, look, look at what is happening. It is horrible. I wish I hadn't seen it. It's just the worst thing in the world. Help. Okay. He's speaking from the other side of judgment. And there's a message in that, a message in that for us for sure. Verse 5. Points out that wealth and privilege didn't make one immune from the horror of the assault. You know, a lot of times, see, wealthy people think, this is why it's a temptation. You put your trust in that, I'm always cool. See, bad things are going to happen to the poor people. Because I can always buy my way out, or I can buy comforts. I can secure myself with my money. That's why the Bible warns so much about it, because it is easy to trust in your money. But you see here, what good did their money do them? Those who once feasted on delicacies, they were highbrow. They ate the best of everything. Those who once feasted on delicacies died in the streets of starvation like everybody else. Guys got a truckload of money, but there's no food. I got a wheelbarrow of money. Sorry, dude. There's no food. It doesn't matter how much money you have. There's no food. Those who once wore the finest clothes, they sought food in the garbage heaps just like the others. They embraced the ash heaps where they burned garbage. What are they doing? They're right in those ash heaps with everybody else looking for something to eat. So see, money and privilege, they weren't spared because of that. He says in verse 6 that the iniquity of Jerusalem was greater than the sin of Sodom. Now Sodom's the proverbial city of evil, right? He says it was greater than the, than the sin of Sodom. Sodom was overthrown in, in a moment without a hand being laid on it, right? That's what happened to Sodom. <clears throat> Smoked it. There was no assault. There was no 18-month siege. There were no people breaking in and slaughtering people. It was kind of quick, and they were gone. So he's comparing this to Sodom. Well, he sits here and he says, look, it was overthrown in a moment. No hand was laid on it. Whereas in Jerusalem, look what happened to us. We endured 18 months of slow, just everything's going, going, going. We're starving, we're starving, we're starving. Then they breach the wall, then they're slaughtering us. So Sodom had it better than that. Verse 7, verse 7 speaks of Jerusalem's leaders or their nobility. Literally it says Nazarites. But the idea it seems to be that that which is, has here is it's taken as one set apart by rank or distinguishing quality. So it seems in a more general sense to refer to, uh, to refer to leaders or nobility. It speaks of Jerusalem's leaders or nobilities as men of impressive appearance. They look like nobility. You say, well, that sounds crazy. What does it mean? Well, you know how we say it. The guy looks like a politician or he looks like a movie star. You know, there is a stereotypical kind of appearance that nobility has. I don't know if it was a Dudley Do-Right chin or whatever it was, but, you know, you had somebody who was, you know, that's, that's an old reference for you folks. You know, you, you see somebody, you know, who just had that look. He had that bearing. And they looked like nobility. That's how they were, you know. They just looked at it. But what's verse 8 say? Verse 8 says that now they're unrecognizable due to the effects of starvation. Those who once were, you know, the stereotypic leader and ruler you know, ruddy complexion. So, you know, this person's like that with, you know, and now look at it. What is this situation now? It says, now their face is blacker than soot. They're not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as wood. They look like, you know, they're, they're skeletons wrapped in shriveled, discolored skin. Like the nightmarish victims of concentration camps. You've seen pictures, haven't you? You've seen pictures, you can barely look at them. Well, this is what has happened to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. 
And what did God tell them? God told them and told them and told them, if you are unfaithful to me and treat me like a dog, I will judge you. And here is what it will be. It will be a disaster and a nightmare and women will be eating their children. And here comes somebody with a language you don't understand who will have no pity. They'll come in and just slaughter you. And then here it is. People said, no, it's not, you know, that's not going to happen, not going to happen. He told them. He told them this is what's going to happen. Now here they are. Here they are enduring this nightmarish thing. Verse 9 points out that those killed by the sword were better off than those left to die of slow starvation. I mean, it just looked, you know, like I said, you know, a bullet in the head be one thing. This, this is bad. You see, so this idea that those who die who were killed by the sword better off than the people who sat there and suffered through, in the starvation. Verse 10, the situation in Jerusalem became so desperate that compassionate women were reduced to the unthinkable act of boiling their own children and eating them. And we don't even like to say that, do we? We don't even like to say it. We say, don't say that. Why do you think God said it? He said it to get your attention. He said it so that emotionally, there's very little that'll grab you like that. That'll get your attention to understand and say, ooh, Oh, man. What, see, viscerally, not just intellectually, viscerally, so that you will see, oh, what a situation, what a circumstance, what a judgment. And so this is what's happening here with these, these women here. He had warned them long ago of that precise result, Leviticus 26, 29, Deuteronomy 28, 52 to 57. Now, perhaps they were only eating them after they died. Okay, perhaps. Still nightmarish. But perhaps they were only doing that, in which case, see, they might be tempted to hasten their deaths by withholding sustenance. You see? Uh, that would get back to verse 3, maybe. Maybe they were refusing to kind of, you know, just withholding so once they died, they could then eat them. And they could rationalize that by saying, no, we're really being kind to them because otherwise it's going to drag out their misery. You see, so that would introduce that temptation if that's the right thing. But in any, any sense, way, sense, shape, you see that it's ultimately, it's just horrible. Absolutely, absolutely horrible. Now, verse 11, verse 11, on the heels of that most gruesome portrait of distress, verse 11 declares that this was the wrath, the hot anger of God poured out on the city. He burned it to the ground. The Lord gave, right after that, says the Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger and he kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. This was the judgment of God. That picture of a fire, just burning everything. Just coming in and judgment. And this is what God poured out on Jerusalem and that is why, I said, when we read these things, that is why I spent three weeks belaboring the extent to which God stressed and told and repeated and begged and cajoled and sent prophets and said, don't, 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 repent, repent, repent. Life is over here. Death is over here. Judgment is coming. Repent. Judgment is coming. And they just consistently said, hey, I think I'll offer my child as a sacrifice. I think we'll, uh, we'll do idols. I think we'll shed innocent blood. I think we will be the opposite of what this voice wants us to be. Okay. And this illusion that God will not execute judgment has to be broken. It is an illusion that is given to us from the other side. Oh, no, no, God's not going to do it. God, God, no, He's just, He will never do that because He has this marshmallow kind of love. This kind of love that is not biblical in any way, shape, or form. He loves to the point of His Son dying. There is no greater love. But He will judge. And the, the idea that He will not is a fog that has been given to us. And I think something like this helps break through that fog. You see, it helps break through that so we'll say, whoa, I see that judgment 
is a reality. Judgment is real. Verse 12, he says that it was the belief of both kings and the people of the world. I think he states this hyperbolically, okay, in exaggeration for effect, where he says all the people of the world. But he says it was the belief of both kings and people of the world that an enemy could not take a resistant Jerusalem by force. This was apparently thought in the world. Now, though the walls had been broken down, the walls of the city had been broken down roughly 200 years earlier by the king of Israel. He had broken down the walls. And though you'd had on numerous occasions or several occasions the city had surrendered, okay, I mean, right before this, you'd had the city surrender, 598, 597, that assault by Nebuchadnezzar, what happened? Well, they surrendered before we, he destroys the city. So you'd had those things. You'd had 200 years earlier, roughly, the, the city walls broken by the king of Israel. You'd had occasions where there had been surrender. But apparently the, the thinking was is that, listen, maybe tied to the uh, episode with the Assyrians under Hezekiah in 701 B.C. But apparently there was widespread thinking that, that uh, doubted that the city is currently fortified could be breached by force. In other words, there was this doubt. People said, no, I, I don't think. If they don't surrender, the way that thing is currently constituted, I don't think it can be taken by force. Now, you can get them around there and scare them and have them surrender, but I think if push comes to shove and you actually have to assault it, I don't think it can be taken. So this was a widespread understanding, apparently, among the people, and um, among the kings and among the people. And then verse 13, see, the city fell the city fell not because of some inadequacy in its physical defenses. That's not why it fell. It wasn't because of some inadequacy of its physical defenses, nor was it because of the might of Nebuchadnezzar, his military strategy, his power, his wisdom, or any of that. It, was, it fell because God was punishing her for her rebellion. That's why it fell. If God had not wanted to punish the city for her rebellion, do you think Nebuchadnezzar would have taken that city? He'd have been no better off than the Assyrians. He'd have been dead if God wanted him dead. They'd have been defeated if God wanted them defeated. That wasn't the reason. It wasn't because the defenses were inadequate or Nebuchadnezzar was so great. It was because God was judging the city. He here singles out the sins of, of the city's prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed the blood of the righteous. Now, what I think he means there is that they were complicit in the shedding of innocent blood in that they enabled or emboldened the perpetrators by failing to represent God accurately to them. They were complicit in the taking of innocent blood. They neglected or they concealed or they lied about God's will and God's anger with the people's disobedience. And thus they shared in the murders by contributing to the climate of lawlessness in which those murders occurred. They sat here and said, no, everything's fine. Place is a nut house, a moral cesspool. And here are the spokesmen of God. Oh, we're great. It's great. It's great. Well, they were complicit then, you see. Instead of this word of God that comes in like a sledgehammer, not like fog, not something that you can blow off and shape to your own desires, like a sledgehammer that comes in bringing God's values, God's judgment, God's meaning. Woo! They didn't bring that word. Now, what did that do? See, that emboldened people, okay, everybody's good, we're all on board, and I cannot help but think about abortion in this society. How can that possibly happen? How can people be intimidated? We are intimidated. We don't want to speak about it. Oh, that's politics, baby. It's killing children. It just drives me crazy. We can't talk about it. Well, I can talk about it. <laughs> you see? But you say, how could that possibly? No one would ever grow silent. Well, there are all kinds of strategies for silencing the Word of God. You see, for co-opting the Word of God, the message of God. Instead of it breaking in and judging and condemning and standing and saying, no, that's wrong, wrong, immoral. Okay? And so I look at this and I say, well, how, how could the prophets and priests be? Well, I can see how it happened. I can see how it would happen. Okay, uh, probably fortunate for you. That's the bell. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>